I don't know if that's good news for you or not, but today's the last class in 1 Corinthians. The problem is, of course, that we've got to do chapter 15 and chapter 16 today. And chapter 15 has 58 verses, so you can imagine how fast we'll have to talk to get it all done. But I imagine that we will. So if you have your Bible, go ahead, be in 1 Corinthians 15. Last week we left off, we basically did an overview style lesson of chapters 12, 13, and 14, which covers spiritual gifts. Chapter 12, everybody has something to contribute. Paul says there are many members but one body, and he talks about how all the different parts of the body connect. The greatest gift is love, and love will remain long after the miraculous age has ceased. In the first century, it would come to a close after the apostles were really. The miraculous age ceased after the last individual died on whom the apostles laid hands. 1 Corinthians 13, 8 through 13. And then in chapter 14, Paul talks about tongues and prophecy and really gives an overview of how does this look in a local assembly. And Paul's admonition is... And we'll have a later class maybe on speaking in tongues and what does that mean biblically. But Paul's admonition is, as far as using gifts in the assembly, one at a time, do everything orderly, and in the end, do things that build up. And Paul says by inspiration, prophecy is more edifying in the local church for believers than tongues, which is really a sign for the unbelievers. And do everything you can to do it in unity of the spirit, decently and in order. That's down through verse 40. And then Paul gets to chapter 15. And chapter 15 has one theme, so you don't have to guess about 1 Corinthians 15. It's all about the resurrection. For 57 verses, Paul will talk about the resurrection. And then in verse 58, he'll talk about why that matters. And so what we're going to do is just try to walk through that outline. And then if we have time, we'll get through some things on chapter 16 and basically Paul tying up loose ends. There's not one thread or theme that runs through chapter 16, but there are several. We won't be able to read all 58 verses, but we are going to read the first four. So if you have your Bible, let's get to 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. The section of scripture that we're going to study this morning in chapter 15, you've heard parts of this, especially maybe 50 through 58 at funerals, you know, about this idea that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God and corruption doesn't inherit incorruption. And I show you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we'll be changed. But there are some things that Paul says within this chapter that we need to give a great amount of detail to. I believe that what Paul says in chapter 15, and we may do an exercise where we run through every book of the New Testament, but what Paul is driving at in chapter 15 about the resurrection and the resurrection body is the goal of the Christian life. In the end, in the New Testament, this is what Paul and the others were actually striving toward, waiting for their resurrection body. And I believe we can prove that through the text, and we'll do that in a minute here as we have time. Let's read the first four verses. Now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel that I preached to you, which you received and which you stand, and by the which also you are being saved, if you hold fast to the word that I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins and according with the scriptures, and that he was buried and that he was raised the third day in accordance with the scriptures. And then in verses 5 through 10, Paul is going to give some examples of individuals who were present for that resurrection. He'll talk about Jesus appearing with his resurrected body to Peter, to the 12, to James, and Paul will include himself last in about verse 8 and verse 9. Last of all, he appeared to me as one born out of due time. And so Paul taught the Corinthians the truth about the resurrection, and then he says in verse 1, that this is a part of the gospel and it's of first importance. Now, when Paul says, if you keep in memory what I've preached, what does it mean if someone says that salvation is conditional? What do we mean by that statement? Salvation is conditional. Well, is salvation conditional? Let's start there. Is our salvation as Christians conditional? Yes or no? Yes. Okay. In what way is it conditional? What does that mean? And how does 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4 help us to authenticate that statement? I agree. Salvation is conditional. In what way is it conditional? And what does Paul say in the first four verses that help us with that conclusion? It's a small word. It's two letters. It starts with I and then F. It's in verse 2. What does he say? If, right? So the gospel has all of these blessings. I delivered to you the gospel. Jesus is the son of God. He was raised and you are saved. That's at the end of verse two or in the middle there. And you are saved by this gospel if you hold fast to the gospel that Paul preached. What was the gospel that Paul preached? What did it consist of? How would you define the gospel in simple terms? Paul says, if you hold fast to this gospel, if you stand in it, then you're going to be saved. So it's conditional. How would you define the gospel? 
the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus is a simple way to put it. Jesus died for our sins. He was buried, and then he rose again the third day according to the scriptures, and that's what Paul gives us here. But Paul is going to launch out from that and say the gospel are not just facts to be believed. That's true. We've got to respond to the gospel, and then there are some ramifications for us as a result of that. We, too, will enjoy a resurrection. And so there was this tension. Some, somebody infiltrated the Corinthian church and started to teach them things contrary to this idea of the resurrection of the body. And you might think about some of the philosophies that were going on in the first century, that, well, we're just spirit beings. That's all that we are. Or, well, we're going to have a resurrected body. The Jews believe that, Daniel 12 and verse 2, that those who sleep in the dust will rise to everlasting life. But they didn't really know a lot about the transformation that was going to take place with this body. But Paul says, number one, you and I are not merely spiritual beings. We're more than that. We are spirit, but we also have bodies. And when God raises them, he's going to do something glorious with them. Now, if somebody had questions about the resurrection and whether or not it really happened, Paul gives some evidence in verses 5 through 10. Notice verses 5 through 10 of 1 Corinthians 15. He appeared to Cephas, that's Peter, and then to the twelve. And then 500 people. Why is Paul giving all of this evidence? And then he says, last of all, he was um, seen by me as one born out of due time. Why is Paul giving all of these historical evidences to the Corinthians to say Peter saw him and then the 12 and hey, there are 500 of them. Some of them have fallen asleep, but some people are still alive. Why would he give that information? Proof. Proof for who? For the Corinthian people that are hearing it. And what else? What's the other reason why he's saying, okay, so this is proof. Jesus died. He rose again. How do you know you weren't there? Paul starts listing these people as proof. And what are the Corinthians or people that are doubting the resurrection supposed to do with that proof? Or potentially, what could they do with it? What was that? Go ask them. That's his point. Yeah, if you look at verse number six, then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some are falling asleep. Paul is saying, if you don't believe me that Jesus rose from the dead, I already preached this to you. He did in Acts 18. But if there are still doubts and questions about what happened to Jesus when he rose from the dead, if there are any questions, it's not just my testimony. He says we've got Peter, the 12 and 500 people saw this. Some of them have died, but some of them are still alive. More of them are alive than are dead. If you have doubts about it, then go and ask them. Christianity at its heart stands and falls on this one reality. Was the tomb empty? Yes or no? That's our greatest apologetic. If Jesus didn't rise from the grave. Paul's going to say this later. We are wasting our time. But if the tomb is empty, that changes everything. Everything in Christianity hinges on that one reality. You know, Jesus was great. He never committed a sin. Hebrews 4, 15 and 16 says he was tempted in all points like we are, but yet without what? Sin. That made him special. Jesus died for our sins and he said that he was going to die. He talked about that often throughout his ministry. And I don't want to diminish the crucifixion because that's important. And Jesus died. But anybody could predict their death. You could predict your death. If you say, well, I'm going to die today and you just go walk out there in front of a bus, you'd be a prophet. You could. But you couldn't predict your resurrection. If somebody says today I'm going to die and then I'll see you Tuesday and then they rise from the dead. Well, that's a different matter. And when Jesus says, I'm going to lay my life down, John 10:18. And then take it up again. Everything hinges on the resurrection. And so as Paul is ending this letter and he's getting to his main point that Jesus did rise from the dead, he's saying, if you have any questions about that, you need to see the individuals that have the proof that were eyewitnesses so that you don't have any more doubts. Now, let's move forward in verses 12 through 19. And because of time, we're just going to try to, like I said, survey this. So Paul gives them the evidence and then he mentions some of the problems with there not being a resurrection. So what if there is no resurrection? Paul says in verse 12, now, if Christ is proclaimed that he rose from the dead, how can some say among you there is no resurrection from the dead? If there is no resurrection from the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain and your faith is vain. And we are found to be misrepresenting God because we testified about God that he raised up Christ, who he did not raise, if it is true that the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and, you're, and you are still in your sins. And then those also who have died in Christ have perished. If in Christ... 
if in Christ we have hope in this life only, we are of all people most to be pitied. And so Paul is saying some things about why the resurrection matters. Here's a question for us. Is Christianity the best way to live your life, even if it's false? Yes. Show of hands for yes. Paul says that's not true. Sometimes I've heard this said, somebody says to the atheist, well, I believe that God is real. I believe God exists. In fact, I believe Jesus is the son of God. But if in the end there is no God, then I still lived a better life than you. And, you know, I'm still a better. In the end, Christianity is the best way to live, even if it's false, even if it's not true. Look at verse 19, though. What does Paul say in verse 19 in response to the question that we just answered and asked? What does Paul say? I know what the verse says, but what is Paul saying in verse 19 about our lives? If Jesus didn't rise from the dead, then what? If we only have hope in Christ in this life, if Christian, Christianity is only good for now, what is Paul saying about our lives then? What does he say? We're miserable. We're pitiful people. If Christianity is only good for now, if there really is no resurrection, if when we die, that's it. Everything we've done, all of the prayers we've prayed, all of the songs that, songs that we've sung, all the Bible we've studied. Neil talked about devotion, all of the hours that we have poured into our relationship with God. If when we die, that's it. Paul says we're the most miserable people in the world. It's not true that Christianity is the best life to live if there is no resurrection. Christianity is the best life to live because this life is not all there is. It's merely the preface for what's to come. Paul is saying Christianity is true. And if it's not, this is not some spiritual exercise that we engage in because we're good people. We're doing this because we really believe that this life is not all. The Corinthians are having some struggle. And Paul is saying, listen, if you don't believe that you're going to be raised when this life is over, you're saying some terrible things about Jesus. And add to that, you're wasting your time. The only thing that ultimately can get us up in the morning and get us going to do the things that we want to do for Jesus, to have the kind of devotion and prayer and in Bible study and meditation in the end is if you really believe there's going to be a resurrection, everything else eventually runs out of gas. Unless you believe two realities. One day I do have to die. And in the second place, when I die, that won't be the end of my life. It'll be the beginning of my eternal life. And everything that I've done now is going to be the determining factor on what happens to me. And so Paul is saying in these verses, if there's no resurrection, Christianity is a waste of time. You can't be a Christian and not believe in the resurrection. And whose resurrection? I didn't hear. Your own and Christ, both. Yeah. You have to believe in Jesus' resurrection, and then there's also a need to believe in your own, that you are going to be raised as well. And to not believe in that is to misunderstand Christianity altogether. Yeah, Chuck, I think that's right, that there's a universal moral law, right? And it's right to do right. It's always right to do the right thing. And people need to know that whether or not they're Christians. And then, of course, the, the punchline is because of the resurrection, all of this eventually does have some value.
Well, okay, I don't want to go. We're going to go down this rabbit hole briefly. Paul says it's not in verse 19, but here's why. And I agree with part of what you said, but here's the problem with it. That only works if life is going your way. So let's take some of Jesus' statements. For example, if there is no resurrection in Matthew chapter 10 and Jesus says, you won't live a good life. He that doesn't love father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. That statement only has merit. It only matters if there is a resurrection. If that's not, that's the cruelest thing to say to somebody. Hey, love me more than your parents. Why would Jesus say that? C.S. Lewis said, you've got three options. Either Jesus is a liar and he misled people by claiming to be the son of God and he's not. Or he's a lunatic on the level with the man that says he's a poached egg or he really is the Lord. And if he's the Lord, then he can make that statement and it matters. But if he's not, there's nothing virtuous about that. I understand. I agree. The principles of moral living and all of that's true. But whether or not somebody pays alimony or whether or not their life is easy doesn't really matter at all in the grand scheme of things. If when you die, that's all there is to it. And also think about people in other places in third world countries that are suffering terribly because they're Christians. And from where they're sitting, their life would be a lot easier a lot, lot, a lot more burden free if they could just get rid of this Christianity business altogether and just kind of mix in with everybody else. And so there is a sense in which, yes, from the standpoint of doing what the Bible says, one spouse, raise your children, do all those things. Christianity is advantageous in those areas. But when it starts costing you to be a Christian, when it's difficult to be a Christian, it's going to be a lot more profitable in eternity if you believe that these things are true. And if you don't, if these things aren't true, then it really doesn't matter in the end. And so from a material standpoint, in some ways, Christianity can be beneficial. But Paul says all that will live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. If there's no resurrection, how did Paul's life get better by being shipwrecked, snake bitten? He was beaten several times by the Jews. There's no value in any of that. His life wasn't better than his Jewish counterparts who just kind of went along with everybody else. His life actually was worse. But because this life isn't the end, Paul was actually winning, though it appeared to everybody watching as if he was losing. And so I agree, the principles from Christianity do profit people, and they can be profitable, but Paul says, in this life, if this is the only hope we have, we're most miserable. He didn't say, well, at the end, you'll live a better life than the pagan Corinthians. He's saying Christianity is different, and it's better because of the resurrection. Okay, well, let's just stick with Paul on the resurrection, but the best things about Christianity, remember, aren't the material or the physical blessings that it affords. Those are sort of byproducts down the road. The greatest things about Christianity are the spiritual blessings that are in Christ Jesus, Ephesians 1, 3. And based on Paul's own testimony in 1 Corinthians 15, if we had everything that Christianity affords and the resurrection wasn't true, we'd be wasting our time. And so... That's just what we have to appreciate about there are some blessings. My life has been better. I've gone in a di direction I never would have gone if it wasn't for all oh, that's true. But in the end, Christianity is not about mere behavioral reform. It's not about that. It's not merely about getting people. Oh, that happens when people become Christians. But that's not the gospel Jesus preached. The gospel Jesus preached is if you believe in me you'll never really die. And that's what people really need to hear. Whatever else is true, in the end, you need a gospel 
that's going to be powerful when hospice comes in. That's what you need. That's what everybody in the world needs. And that's what Jesus gives us. Okay, verses 20 down through 34. Paul says, you don't have to worry about that. This whole discussion we're having really doesn't matter. Because guess what? Verse 20, Christ has been raised from the dead. He's the first fruit of those who have fallen asleep. And so, what does it mean that Christ is the first fruits of those that have fallen asleep? What are the first fruits? This is an Old Testament idea. You might go to Exodus 23, 19, Numbers 15, 17 through 21. What are the first fruits? The first of his kind, yeah. And what does the first fruit say about a crop? What does that mean? Well, we give him the best, the first, but what do first fruits suggest in an agricultural society? The rest is coming. That's right, Chuck. There's more to come. So Christ rose from the dead, and because he rose from the dead, we're going to rise as well. And so from verse 20, really down through verse 28, Paul talks about the idea that one day we're going to be raised. Because Christ did rise from the grave, we don't have to worry about staying in the grave. Look at verse 21. For as by man came death, by man has also come the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ all will be made alive. But each in his own order. Christ the first fruit, and then those who belong to Christ at his coming. And then the end will come in verse 24. When Jesus comes back, we're going to be raised. And then he says in verse 24, Jesus is going to deliver up the kingdom to God. He's going to give us to God the Father. And verse 28 ends this in summarizing it by saying, God will be all in all. Now, God is all in all now, but in the resurrection, there'll be no rivals. There'll be no more division in the world. Everything will be in subject to God. And Jesus says, because, Paul says, because there is a resurrection that we can look forward to, we can hope in that without any doubt. The Corinthians and Christians today at Lehman Avenue and throughout the world have not put our hope in the wrong thing. Paul is saying, you haven't wasted your time. There is a resurrection. And because there's a resurrection, you can look forward with confidence and assurance that as Jesus was raised, you'll be too. When you go to the empty tomb and you say, hey, Jesus isn't here, you know what that means. One day, somebody's going to come to your tomb and my tomb, and we won't be there either. We'll be raised. One commentator said in John 11, Jesus called Lazarus forth so that he could go in in Lazarus's place. He went into the grave. But as Jesus came out one day, just like he called Lazarus forth in John 11:43, one day, every one of us will hear our names in that same regard. He'll say, come out of the tomb and we're going to rise from the dead. Go to John 5 briefly. John 5. And notice what Jesus says in verse 28 and 29 about the assurance of the resurrection. John 5, 28 and 29, Jesus says, do not marvel at this or don't be surprised at this. The hour is coming into which all that are in the grave will hear his voice and come forth. Those that have done good to the resurrection of life and those that have done evil to the resurrection of condemnation. Jesus assures the resurrection is going to take place. It's going to happen. And if there's any doubt about it, once Jesus rises from the grave, he says, I'll take care of the rest of you. Jesus is the first fruits, and he is the reason why we can, assure, we can be assured that we'll rise from the dead. So in John 5, 28 and 29, we have that statement. And because there is a resurrection, now that gives meaning to all of the suffering that Christians sometimes experience. That's verses 29 through 34, 1 Corinthians 15. He'll talk about those that are suffering, and he'll mention himself as being in Ephesus in verse 32 and suffering in the arena and various things. Paul says, look, we went through all of this stuff. We've gone through all of this. Do you think we would do all of these things if we didn't believe in the resurrection? And then there's that comment in verse 33. Do not be deceived. Bad company does what? Or evil communications do what? Ruin good morals. Now that verse is often quoted to youth groups and stuff, right? And what is it supposed to be teaching? You watch who you hang around, evil communications, corrupt. Hey, peer pressure. Methuselah is the only person I know that didn't have to worry about peer pressure, right? All of us have peers, right? All of us, and as long as you have peers, there'll be peer pressure. In context, 1 Corinthians 15, 33 is about whoever. We don't know who these individuals were, but they had infiltrated the church at Corinth and started these doubts about the resurrection. And Paul gives his argument and then he says, hey, by the way, be careful. Evil companionship 
is going to ruin good morals. It'll affect what you think. The doctrines you believe and hold to are going to be affected by the people you hang around. And so beware that you don't allow other people to influence you away from the truth. There will be a resurrection. That's Paul's main point. Verse 34, wake up from your drunken stupor as it is right and do not go on sinning for some have no knowledge of God. I say this to your shame. If you thought that this life was all there was and you said, well, I can live however I want. There's going to be no reckoning. There's going to be no accounting day. I can do whatever I want to do. Paul says, don't fall for that. There's going to be, look at 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 10. And notice that Paul not only says something about a judgment, but remember I said that the resurrection runs throughout the New Testament as a thread. There's not just an emphasis in the Bible on what we do and that we're going to be judged, but it's often linked to this very body because this body is going to be raised. And so 2 Corinthians 5.10, Paul says, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ that every one of us may receive a judgment for the things that we've done where? And this body, according to what we've done, whether it's good or bad, evil companions corrupt good morals. Evil companions will have you to say, don't believe all that fairy tale stuff. Preachers made that up. There's not going to be a resurrection. This life is it. You can put a period. Paul says, no, put a comma. There's going to be more to follow. There's going to be a judgment and it's going to be based on what we've done in these bodies. And so it matters. Awaken, Corinthians. Don't fall for this. Now, what do you think the next logical question someone has in their mind when they hear, hey, there's going to be a resurrection? What types of questions do you think somebody might ask? Will I have the same body? That's a good question. And that's what they wanted to know. If the dead are raised, then with what bodies do they come? What kind of bodies do people have in the resurrection? What's the answer to that? Incorruptible. Spiritual. I'm good with new. Yeah, I like just new. All of the things that have been said are right. And then there's also an aspect of this. We just don't know. We don't know all of the particulars, but we do know that we're going to have new bodies. Russell, go ahead. Yeah, it'll be an immortal body. Is that what you said? Yeah, it'll be a forever body. These bodies break down and they eventually decay. In fact, they're breaking down more and more every day. Right? Yep. Oh, like, will there be... You know, like, certain words, like, in, in Greek, when it's translated, it's like, well, no, this actually means, like, yeah. baptism, it means, you know, immerse. So, is there any nuance in the language with the word body in this context? No, the word Paul uses for body is soma. He uses it throughout 1 Corinthians 15. And it just means body. Now, he's going to say some things about a spiritual body. And this matters because sometimes a Christian may think, well, in the resurrection, I'm going to have a spirit. And that's true. But we won't be just aimless spirits floating throughout eternity. We won't be that way. That's not the gospel Paul preached. There's not just a resurrection. There's a bodily resurrection. And soma is the word that he uses throughout. It's the same word in 2 Corinthians 5.10. And there's nuance, no nuance to get around this. It is just that fact. It's going to be a body. A body like whose? Who's the first fruit of our resurrection? Christ. And when he was raised from the dead, and I believe when Jesus ascended, surely there was the final glorification of that body. He had the marks in his body when Thomas met him in John 20. That's probably done away with now. I would argue that it is. But he still had a body. He was a human. Remember what he said in Luke 24 when they said they were confused about whether or not it was him? A spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see me have. Luke 24, he was a body. He had his same body when he rose from the dead. There's going to be some continuity between the bodies we now possess and the body we'll have in the resurrection. Transformed, yes, but a body nonetheless. Brittany and then Chuck. Sorry. Yeah, I think it's a fact that we can know one another. If you're asking about knowing one another in heaven and recognition, for sure. Jesus said in Matthew 8, 11, many will come from the east and the west in the resurrection and sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and who else? And Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. 
that statement makes no sense if I won't know Abraham, Isaac, or Jacob. So there's going to be some recognition, right? You're going to be you in the resurrection, and I'm going to be me. And we're going to be able to recognize each other. And that, that's one. Yeah, Lazarus and the rich man in Luke 16, there is some recognition that continues. Now, we'll go to a passage in a minute that says, basically, let's not get too far ahead of ourselves. There are some limitations on what we can know. But things like that, that the body will be spiritual, that it will be immortal, that it will be a body, that it will be, there was something else about it, no pain or something like that. Those things are true. But there are some things about the resurrection body that we don't know. Chuck? That's a good point. You wouldn't have said, you, I mean, how are we going to know who he is unless he is recognizable as the person Jesus just said that to? That's right. In eternity, we will be glorified. That's what Paul says in Romans 8, 18. We're going to enjoy glory with God. That doesn't mean that we're going to lose recognition of ourselves or our wits about us. In fact, in that moment, they will be more enhanced than they've ever been before. It's not the case that we're just going to drop. Everything's going to drop out of our memories. And I know there are more questions that come with this, like, well, if I'm going to be me and you're going to be you, what if I see if I don't see somebody that I expect to see and people have questions about sorrow and heaven and all of that? Maybe you didn't. And I introduced it. But anyway, it does come up sometimes and people wonder about that. Well, what's going to happen? The same God who made us from dust and who's going to reconstitute our glorious bodies already has all of that under control. So we don't have to worry too much about this. But let's go to 1 John 3. 1 John 3, and I just want to show you what John says about this. And then, well, let's just progress. We'll see what happens. 1 John 3, 1 through 3. Notice what John says about our future state. See what kind of love the Father has given us that we should be called the children of God. And so we are. The reason why the world does not know us is it didn't know him. Verse 2, beloved, we are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet appeared. But we know that when he appears, we will be like him, and we will do what? See him as he is. It doesn't, we don't know all of what's going to happen now, but we know when Jesus comes, we'll be like him and we'll see him as he is. And every time the Bible touches on the resurrection, every time it says you're going to have a resurrected body, it gives you that information and then it follows with something else. And it's in 1 John 3 and verse 3. Everybody that has this hope in him purifies himself as he is pure. The Bible says you're going to be resurrected. Your body is going to be glorious one day. And because of that, live the right way now. And Paul's going to do the same thing at the end of 1 Corinthians 15 with a verse we know well and we're familiar with. But the motivation behind living for Jesus is you're going to have a resurrection body. Why is that appealing, by the way, a body that's going to be resurrected? Why would that be appealing? <laughs> Yeah, that's right. The ones we have now, they hurt. What else? This body dies. They fail us. It has weaknesses, right? But in the resurrection, when the body is renewed, it's going to be different. Let's read a little bit more. What time do we quit? I always forget. I always think it's 1130 and it's not. What time is it? 20. All right. Go ahead. So our spirit will be the same. Our spirit will be the same when we leave here. Our spirit will be the same. Yeah. Okay, so that's a good question about our spirits. What's going to happen with our spirits? We do possess a spirit, and it's an eternal part of us. We're really triune people. Some people say we're bilateral, but those terms are used interchangeably. We have body, soul, and spirit. Some people say soul and spirit are used interchangeably throughout the Bible, and you could make two out of that. That may be the case. But we're body, soul, and spirit. The soul that we have, the eternal part of us, is going to go on and live forever. But remember what James said, the body without the spirit is what? It's dead, right? But when Jesus raises us from the grave, there's going to be body reuniting with soul, and we'll be resurrected, and our soul will live on eternally, but not apart from our bodies. You got that? Not apart from our bodies. In the resurrection, it won't be apart from the body that the spirit will live. It'll be united together. We're going to be body and soul and spirit again. A new body, yes. So if you nicked yourself on your knee when you were nine in the resurrection, don't look for the nick. It probably won't be there, right? Your body's going to be transformed, but you're going to have a body. Some of y'all are looking at me strange, but it's what the New Testament says, I know. And, well, 
let's just do this. Let's stop. We've got a little bit of time. I want to show you how often this thread runs throughout the New Testament. Is this important? Because maybe you knew this already. Maybe you didn't. Maybe we haven't emphasized this as much as we should. But nobody reads the New Testament and walks away not thinking this was their main idea. This was the main objective for Christians. I want to live with God forever. But added on to that, I want to live with God forever in my new body. There was a hand back. Yep. Go ahead and turn to Philippians 3 for the first one. Oh, we got plenty of time. Yep. Okay, so 1 Thessalonians 4.14 says, We don't want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who are asleep, that you sorrow not as those that have no hope. And then 14. 1 Thessalonians? 1 Thessalonians 14. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, them also that sleep in Jesus will God bring with you. Mm -hmm. Who are those people? The dead in Christ that arise first. So... Who's coming with God? Who are those people? Well, okay, so there's a stage, there's a progression. Let's just do it briefly. The Bible says the trumpet will sound, the angels, he's going to come with the angels, the archangels, Matthew 24, 40, 31 through 46. There'll be the angels with Jesus, and then the dead in Christ at the time of his arrival will rise first. They'll be caught up together with him in the clouds, and then those of us that are still remaining will be caught up together with him. So it's really a twofold question. Initially, Jesus and the angels, and then the dead in Christ that are raised, and then finally, they'll come to gather up those that are righteous and in Christ that are still alive. Does that answer the question? If you're talking about the initial, when the trumpet blasts, who's coming with Jesus, based on the New Testament, it'll be the angels coming with him. Who are the angels? Who are the angels? Well, one of them's Michael, and another one's named Gabriel. I don't know the rest. <laughs> the, dead in the dead in Christ are Christians who have died in Christ. Okay. Are their spirits not the ones that are coming with you? Um, I'm, I'm getting a little confused. Let's just read the text. Stay in Philippians 3. We're going. Don't worry. But let's do this first Thessalonians 1. But we don't want you to be uninformed, brothers, about those who are asleep. I'm in 13. That's dead Christians. Paul's telling the Thessalonians, we don't want you to be concerned about Christians who've died before you. The Thessalonians had a problem with whether or not people that died, same problem, by the way, which is interesting. This idea about the resurrection in 1 Corinthians 15, similar problem with the Thessalonians. Paul says, you have loved ones who have died, but don't sorrow. Don't be sad about that like those that have no hope. Christians can be sad when their loved ones die. The Bible says you can. So don't ever tell a Christian, well, don't worry about that there in heaven. You can be sad. It's natural. But Paul says, not as those without hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, those which sleep in Jesus will God bring with them. And so they're going to be raised. Not only is Paul saying, listen, your dead loved ones are going to be in Christ. They're going to be resurrected. He says something better. They'll beat you there. They're going to be there first. And then we which are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And we'll always be with the Lord. And so the dead in Christ are going to rise first, Christians. And then people that are alive, there'll be a reuniting. All right, Philippians 3. Well, we'll have to say something about chapter 16 near the end just so we can say we did, okay? But it doesn't look like we're going to get there. Philippians 3, I just want to show you in a few places how often this resurrection terminology comes up. So Philippians 3, verse 10, Paul is talking about his goal as a Christian, that he may know him, that's Jesus, and the power of his resurrection and that he might share in his sufferings, and that he might become like Jesus in his death. Now notice verse 11, that by any means, if possible, Paul wants to attain to what? The resurrection of the dead. That's, Paul, that's what Paul wants. And if you notice verses 12 through 14, this pressing toward the goal of the upward call that we always mention, for Paul, that was about the resurrection of the dead. Look at verse 20 in the same chapter, Philippians 3. Our citizenship is in heaven. From where also we look for our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will change our lowly body. That's what he says, our vile body, if you're reading the old King James. That it might be fashioned like his glorious body, according to the working by which he's able to subdue all things to himself. Paul says the resurrection is going to change our bodies and our bodies are going to be made like Jesus. Paul says that's my goal. Look at Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. And I believe I want verses 10 and 11. Romans 8, and this whole chapter is about the Holy Spirit, or at least the victorious life we have in the Spirit. 
Romans 8, start in verse 9. You, however, are not in the flesh, but you're in the spirit. If, in fact, the spirit of God dwells in you, anyone who does not have the spirit of Christ does not belong to him. Verse 10. But if in Christ, if Christ is in you, although your body is dead because of sin, the spirit is life because of righteousness. Now notice verse 11. If the spirit of him who raised up Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised up Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to what? Your, your mortal body. Which mortal body? The one you are currently housed in or your spirit is housed in. He's going to give life to this body by the Holy Spirit which dwells in you. The Holy Spirit quickened Jesus or gave life to him and one day he's going to do the same thing to our bodies. Let's do one more. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. You could do this with just about every book in the New Testament and go through and note how often this idea is brought up. That there's going to be a resurrection of the body. That this was the main thought in the minds of the apostles as it related to why we do what we do and why we live the Christian life. 2 Corinthians 4 and verse 13 says, since we have the same spirit of faith according to what has been written. I believed and so I spoke. We believe and we also speak, knowing that he who raised up the Lord Jesus, look at 14, will raise us also with Jesus and bring us with you into his presence. And then he's going to talk about this idea that our light momentary affliction is for a moment, but we're waiting for a glorious body. Chapter 5 and verse 1 of 2 Corinthians says, we know that if this earthly house of our tent is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal and in the heavens. That new tent, that new body, that's what Paul's talking about. If this tent, this body is destroyed, we're not worried about it. Why? We have a new body, not made with hands, eternal and in the heavens, and God's going to fix it. All right, let's finish chapter 15, and then I'll just briefly say some things about chapter 16, and that'll be it. I appreciate the comments and questions, and um, I've enjoyed the study this quarter. But what Paul says at the end here is really important. Because there is a resurrection. So he talks about the resurrection body in 35 through 49. Somebody says, well, what kind of bodies will we have and with what bodies do we come? Paul says that they're glorious, that they're going to be transformed, that they're going to be imperishable, all the things that we talked about. And so what? What's the so what of all of this? And when we study the Bible, that should be our question. So what? What does all of this mean? It's in verse 50. I tell you this, brothers, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. For this perishable body must put on the imperishable, and this mortal must put on immortality. When the perishable puts on the imperishable and the mortal puts on immortality, then will come to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. And then he gets to his punchline in 58. Therefore, since all that Paul has said in verses 1 through 57 is true, therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know what? What does Paul say? Your labor is not in vain in the Lord. So if you work for God in this body, you don't have to wonder, well, what if this body wears out? I'm giving my all to Christianity. Paul says, do more. Be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding. That word always abounding, Paul is saying, if this is the line of mediocrity, you go beyond it. You always abound because what you do in this body is not in vain. You've never invited anybody to worship in vain or pray to prayer in vain or study scripture or any of that in vain. Paul's saying, you don't have to worry about it. You can give your all to Christianity. It's the only thing in this life that you can say, I haven't done that in vain. There's going to be a return, a glorious one. The motivation for being faithful, for coming to worship, evangelizing is in the end, God's going to remember, God's going to reward, and ultimately God is going to resurrect. And because of that, always abound in the work of the Lord. Your labor is not in vain in the Lord. This same body that you have now is going to be transformed. It'll be different and God's going to change it. And it's going to be in direct proportion to what we've done. Chapter 16, was that the second bell or the first one? That's the first one. Okay. And then in chapter 16, Paul summarizes what he said, what he said just thus far. The collection for the saints is an important topic where he says there's going to be a need. You Corinthians are to set something aside. Do this every first day of the week. Chapter 16, verse 2. 
He's sending Timothy in verses 5 through 11 and verse 10 and 11. He says, make sure when Timothy comes, he's with you without fear because he does the work of the Lord just like I do. And then he encourages them to be faithful. And he ends with the salutation. The Corinthians are to remain steadfast in the Lord, to love one another and to be faithful to their calling. I know we went through that pretty quickly. We may have a minute or two. Are there any other questions about chapter 15 and the resurrection or anything we've discussed so far? That's right. Matthew is the only person that mentions that in his gospel account. But it's a good point that those things happened even in the first century. There were people that were raised at Jesus's death. And it's really a precursor of what's going to happen at the end of time, that everybody's going to be raised. Oh. Yeah, so Paul says an effectual door has been opened to me and I want to be there. Paul wants to be there because there's going to be this great opportunity when the Jews come for Pentecost to preach to the Jews and hopefully to convert them. Yeah, the day of Pentecost, you mean? Oh, yeah, it happened every year. So it happened every year for the Jews. It came 50 days after the um, Passover. It's a Jewish thing. Leviticus 23 tells you all about it. It happened every year. And so Paul wants to be there for Pentecost so that he wants to be in Jerusalem for Pentecost because all the Jews come there all this every year for the Feast of Pentecost. Yeah, in Acts 2. It was one Pentecost, yeah, but there were many before and after. Yeah, that's right. All right, anybody else? Well, you're out of school early. Great. Um, David Palman is going to be teaching James, and I'll be teaching something else. I'll, I'll be doing um, 